Each of you will be able to give a three minute opening statement and then we will go to your questions. But why don't we begin and we'll have a, a three minute opening statement from Karina Telemontes. Good morning, Sacramento Bee Editorial Board. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to be here with you today. My name is Karina Telemontes and I am running for Sacramento City Council in District 3. The new District 3 boundaries are from Marina to north, I mean south to the river, down to the 49er truck stop, the Roca Willow Creek neighborhood, and Northgate Garland community. Uh, this new district is in a unique position to finally be one community of interest and to be a strong voice at the dais at City Hall. A little bit about me. I'm originally from Willis, California, a small country town two hours north of here. My mom worked in the olive canneries and fruit canneries all her life on the graveyard shift to be able to be there during the day to take care of me and my siblings. My father passed away um, in the workplace. Uh, he worked in the fields and worked in an almond orchard for 12 years. When I was 19 at UC Davis, he passed away because of unsafe working conditions. And that's a big part of my life because I had to grow up fast and I had to make sure that I was there to help take care of my mom and take care of my own mental health and my siblings. So thankfully, because of a program called Educational Talent Search, it's a federally funded program that helps low income and first generation kids. Um, it's been around for 50 years. I was able to get to UC Davis. At UC Davis, I was involved with a lot of college access programs again, helping and mentoring young kids in Sacramento. I graduated there in 2011, and I went to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work with the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics under President Obama. Afterwards, I came home and I worked in special ed, helping kids with IEPs from three years old to 24 year olds. Then I worked at Yuba Community College and UC Davis, again, working in education, working for Educational Talent Search, the same program that helped me get to where I'm at today. I wanted to make sure that I gave back. So I have a total of eight years of working in education. Afterwards, I worked in the private sector, connecting people to jobs in Fortune 500 companies. Then after Donald Trump got elected, I got involved with the political party in Sacramento. I joined the Democratic Party. And I was involved for about a year when in 2018, I got, to, I got asked to run for office by a former Sac City board member. I ran a grassroots campaign in 2018 and won my election where I'm currently serving as president of the Sacramento County Board of Education. I'm also a chief of staff to Vice Mayor Angelique Ashby, one of the most tenured people on the dais today. And I have absorbed so much institutional knowledge and background. Uh, I'm a small business owner. I am uh, excited and motivated to help my, my community. I will be focused on public safety, but more than police and fire, and make sure that we invest in our parks, our bike trails, road resurfacing, I'll make sure I work on homelessness, unhoused Sacramentans are Sacramentans. We've got to do better. And I will get into the policy points in a little bit. I'm happy to share my endorsements in a, in a few. Thank you so much, Marcus. 10 seconds left. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. And now uh, we'll have three minutes from Michael Lynch. Thank you all for the opportunity to share a little about who I am and why I'm running uh, for city council. So I'm from Sacramento. Went to Valley High School in South Sac, a community that was talent rich, but rather not opportunity. And that's where I quickly sort of realized the resource differential that exists between communities. Because you can imagine Mac Road and Center Parkway was not the haven for internships and economic development opportunities for young people. I went to school with some phenomenal individuals who are passionate, intelligent, hardworking, but the opportunities weren't there for most of us to be able to truly excel. I, I was fortunate because although I grew up in a single parent home, sometimes we had enough, sometimes we didn't. I had a phenomenal dad. My dad was my baseball coach, basketball coach, football coach, even dressed up as Santa Claus in my elementary school every year. But having a phenomenal father and playing football was my pathway to college. But my freshman year in college, my life changed. I got a phone call at midnight. I said, one of my friends was shot and killed. Because for me, it was a moment where I was sad that I had lost a friend, but I felt guilty I was away from my neighborhood, my community. I knew the same stuff was gonna happen over and over again it often did. That was my pathway to service. I didn't know at 17, that's why I decided something else had to be done because the status quo was not working. I graduated from college, got a master's degree from Sac State, and I came back to my community to be able to work in the state capitol where I served as six years as a senior advisor, hoping to craft public policy that directly affects the lives of 40 million people. 
But in 2013, what I continue to recognize that this cycle of the college opportunity gap for young men of color was persistent, prevalent, and growing. So again, I said, I'm going to do something about it. So I created an organization called Improve Your Tomorrow that is dedicated to closing the college opportunity gap for young men of color. 17 young people showed up on April 6, 2013 at Valley High School. Today, we serve 3,000 young men of color across five counties and over 50 schools, and we have closed the college opportunity gap. 99% of our young men graduate high school a long time, and 82% attend college. We have a $90 million budget. We employ 130 people, 50 right here in the district, in District 3, who have helped to solve a problem that was prevalent, but not, not for the IYT young people now. But what brings me here today seeking the, the support is that the most frustrating part of the job for me as a nonprofit leader was to take my young brothers back home to their community. And what I saw was the same thing almost every single time. They were living in dilapidated housing, the community was unsafe, and the parents were struggling to make ends meet. I kept expecting somebody else to come along and solve the problem. I kept thinking the next elected person will come in and they'll make sure that these, these neighborhoods are walkable or safe, there's a better housing stock in place. And But that wasn't happening. So I decided to run for elected office. Great, thank you both for staying uh, on time. Appreciate that. So uh, we will now begin uh, with uh, questions from the journalists and we'll begin with my colleague, Yusuf Bey. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, appreciate your time. Glad you're here. Uh, uh, I'm our assistant opinion editor, and I cover city issues for our editorial board. And, and so I, uh, I want to just first kind of begin with the, the mass shooting that occurred yesterday on Sunday, um, obviously weighing heavy on the hearts of all of us and, and our entire community. Um, you know, just wanted to start maybe with like a statement from from both of you guys about, you know, your thoughts and your feelings about it. And, and um, you know, what sort of action policy you feel like city leaders should be pursuing in this moment given the public is is looking for something in response to this um so michael let's start with you uh, yusuf my 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 pathway to service began with my friend being shot and killed uh, the communities that i lived at yusuf now were unsafe you know we were right it was often fearful man to be able to walk to the store to go out at night to dress and dress. i lived in communities man that were saturated with gang violence. I lived in communities that were saturated or with all the elements of poverty. So like, like violence is like violence is nothing uh, new to me, but it saddens me that how we continue to have the same problems time after time. Five weeks ago, we just had, you know, three little girls right taken right because of a uh, right because of gun violence. Right. Today we have we have 18 people, six who are dead, 12 who are affected because of gun violence. So we have to do more to be able to get guns off the street and that's right that's important um right so i support right the ability to make sure that we retain high quality uh, right, and attract diverse candidates within uh both this activity but we have to do more on the prevention side we have to do more to make sure that we are investing and advancing in the office of violence prevention which provides critical services and programs like the peacemaker fellowship and then uh, right and brother to brother we have to do more to make sure that we are building actual relationships between SAC PD and communities of color, especially our community, like especially our black community, which has a high degree of mistrust. I mean, what would it look like instead of driving down the street if the officer got outside and walked? An expanded based, community based by policing model that was more effective. Also, think too, in order for us to begin to build a safer community, we have to tackle urban blight. When was the last time you all walked down Northgate or Garden Land and saw the status of the community? We have to be able to make sure that we are having, you know, there, there's programs like in Philadelphia, the basic basic assistance repair program, where they tackle urban blight right, and crime dropped 20%. So I think like the shootings are often uh, uh, like a, an illness of what for us, you know, we're not, we're not taking care of the symptoms as a city. Karina, if you want to uh, jump in there, three minutes for you as well. I think that today and the day after the church incident in the Arden Kate area was really heavy. It was really heavy on us, our community, our city, and our country. Um, as someone that's working in public service now, it's tough. It's tough to respond to these issues. It's important to one, invest in our community, two, prevent our youth, youth prevention, investing in our youth, three, building community relationships, 
and a community response team that can work directly with our Sacramento Police Department to help respond to these issues. Four, figure out how we can help families with funeral costs. Funerals are expensive, $40,000 minimum. They're expensive for a family. And when something like this happens, where do you find those dollars? When I was 19, we buried my father. Because he passed away in a workplace accident, we had the bear the funeral costs covered. But had he not, I don't know where we would have found that money. Through my day capacity, um, I helped the mother of the church incident uh, bury her daughters in privacy, away from people, away from the media, I'm sorry, away from people that were maybe trying to use a horrible incident for political opportunities. And many times we wish people will show up to the scene to make a comment, to make a statement. And after it's all said and done, people walk away and we can't do that. We gotta help families with the next steps. And that means emotional support, family support, financial support, and calling and checking in. Because yesterday, I called the family to say, how are you holding up? Because this is the second tragic thing in Sacramento, and it's unacceptable. And we gotta get our streets. We gotta do more community-based policing. We gotta invest in our neighborhoods. We gotta invest in our in security in our businesses and making sure that we can still have Sacramento thrive and recover. But we, at the end of the day, we got to make sure that people feel safe. Public safety is important in all aspects. It's, in safe, it's, it's important that you feel safe walking down downtown or that I can pump gas at Chevron at 3.30 without getting assaulted on Northgate. It's important that we invest in traffic lights on Northgate. There's three different traffic lights on Northgate where cars speed 50 miles per hour, where three front-facing schools are facing the road. And these projects have had funding, but we haven't done enough to put these traffic lights in place. You know, we're at time. Safety means more than that. So thank you. Um, I'd like to stay on um, this point, uh, please. And so if you're a member of the Sacramento City Council in the fall, uh, what specifically would you do to invest in youth? And let's start with Karina. Uh, on on this one, and um, like I said, let, what, please watch the, both of you. Please watch the chat as we. Uh, I'll prompt you when we get to thirty seconds left. So, Karina, why don't you start? What specifically would you do to invest in youth as a member of the city council? Okay, and apologies for going on board on the last one. Uh, one, our Sacramento, Sacramento Public Library needs more investment. The community center in South Natomas has a phase two, but that phase two hasn't happened. Two, we need more parks. South Natomas needs more parks. The communities of Northgate and Garland need more parks. We need more activities on the ground. I see students and kids doing pickup soccer in uh, Chuck Wagon Park, the park nearest to me. My own family set up a kickball tournament and we all came out there and utilized the park. The parks are safe spaces, especially for families of low socioeconomic status the families that can't afford to go to a museum or travel to San Francisco or Disneyland. We gotta invest in our bike trails. Nino's Parkway was also an incident of a shooting two and a half weeks ago. It was neighbor to neighbor. The day before I was out there with Sac Republic and Greenhouse doing soccer activities for two hours, the next day there was also a shooting in that area. So what do we need to do? We need to invest in our community. We got to make sure that we have more programs where kids can sign up for soccer or baseball or tournaments at our parks. We got to make sure our community centers are open more long hours. We got to make sure that we're investing in programs like Stanford Settlement in District 3 and Greenhouse and all the incredible organizations doing a lot of the groundwork in District 3. We got to make sure that prevention is always the key and one of the solutions. To the before before they become problems. 
And, you know, when I look back at myself, I mean, shoot, the educational talent search program hired someone for $60,000 a year who came and then mentored 500 students. That was a good return on investment. Look where I'm at today. And that was thanks to government resources. I'm a firm believer that government works and that government can work so long that we make it inclusive, accessible, and we meet people where they're at. We got to do better in government. And that's my goal here is to become a liaison between the hardworking residents of District 3 that are working two to three jobs trying to make ends meet to make sure that they have a roof over their head, that they have food on the table for their families. They don't have time to call the city council to wait on consent for item 20 uh, to do public comment for two minutes and wait on that for six hours. They don't have that bandwidth, not because they don't want to, but because they can't, because it's getting unattainable to live in Sacramento. I want to be that trusted voice. and I have experience. I'm qualified, I'm ready, and I'm excited because I have a lot of community support and I've been on the ground listening because listening is the most important thing we can do as elected officials right now. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you will have three minutes to answer the question. Yeah, you know, you know Marcos, man, one of the most frustrating parts of my job um, as a nonprofit leader is standing across the, I'm um, standing like in front of the dais asking like city council members to invest in youth. Because time and time again, like they have failed through and through. I was a part of the Measure G campaign. You know, we, were, we were trying to get the city to be able to allocate a certain percentage of funds to support young people and programs and effective programs. And they failed us time and time again. Man, I'm standing in front of the diet saying, hey, listen, here's an effective program. Here's what works. Like, and they, like, they fall silence on investing in young people. The future of our city by far will be determined by the investments in young persons. That, that 24 year old who, who may have uh, burglarized the home at one point, they were a 12 year old who may not who may have needed a little more additional support and love. So I think there's a couple of different things that you can do to really um, expand and scale in investments in young one and young people. One is like we need a clear career pathway model in Sacramento. We have thousands of seniors graduating every year who don't understand or know right the power of right, going to access a vocational school. Uh, for, for a college degree, military. We need a clear pathway model and the city needs to act as a convener, right? To be a convener to establish a model where like an 18 or 17 year knows, knows have options of what they wanna do rather than operate in silos. Well, I think about the power of place-based initiatives. So we're we're in the AmeriCorps program. AmeriCorps is a, a right, $100 million, $1.2 billion federal program that invests in cities and localities. But there, there is, there is no point why we can't. We, there is no reason why we can't do what we did in Stockton a couple of years ago with have AmeriCorps invest twelve million dollars in the city of Sacramento to bring one hundred and fifty AmeriCorps members who will serve fifteen thousand kids over the course of a year. You couple that with scholarships. You couple that with career pathways. What you get is a better opportunity. What the the role that the city can play and continues to play is a convener. I think about like the Sacramento Promise Program. Why, why, can't, why can't Sacramento have a promise program in which it leverage philanthropic resources with city resources to be able to scholarship young people right, to vocational education right, or to college? I think about scaling up effective programs like Landscape and Learn. Phenomenal idea, right? So that, that, that same park, right? The Chuck Wagon Park or Northgate Park or Gardenland Park still needs a little bit of repair and love. Landscape and Learn employs young people to go and do that. You walk across District 3, what you see mostly on the east side is trash. There's trash on San Juan and Northgate, right? There's, there's, there's trash all throughout the district. That same program needs to be scaled up to employ young people to help to make sure that their neighborhoods are clean. Okay, so just if the journalist could just indulge me just for one second. So, Michael, you mentioned you were involved in the Measure G campaign? Correct. On the pro side? You were in favor of Measure G. Correct. Yes. Okay. So for the for the journalists, Measure G uh, was a measure that um, came before the voters, and it would have, if it had passed, it would have required the city uh, to set aside 2.5 percent of the city's unrestricted revenues to invest in youth. Uh, the Sacramento B. Uh, Marco, still on mute. I'm sorry. You just... <laughs> the Sacramento B. about endorsed Measure G. Uh, it went down. Uh, it was it was um, it was um, supported uh, in our, our more impoverished neighborhoods and opposed in our more well-heeled neighborhoods. 
Um, uh, and so, so if I could just ask Karina uh, to uh, and, and take two minutes to answer this, Angelique Ashby, your boss, your mentor, led the charge against Measure G. Did you agree with her? And if so, why? I did not take a stand on this position because it's an area of where I conduct business. I am president of the Sacramento County Board of Education. I see firsthand a lot of the challenges that we have both in education and in how we partner together as government institutions and agencies to support one another. And I think that we need to do a better job working with our schools, with our libraries, and making sure that our Sacramento Public Library isn't competing against funding against different nonprofit agencies. This is a gov this is a leg of the city of Sacramento. So for me, that's something that kind of is an area of concern when it came to this measure. But I didn't I didn't take a stand during this uh, ballot initiative. Marcos, can I respond, Marcos? Uh, uh, yes, if you could just respond briefly. Yes. Yeah. To, to me, like that, that is that is one of the concerns I had as a nonprofit leader. And knowing that how important it is to invest in young people, and we have city leaders like not being an advocate for outside of a couple of council members, like there there has not been a champion for young people on the count. So now now that Jay is leaving and Jay has like Jay Schneer has been like the leading champion and he's supporting my campaign because I am the youth person. I have dedicated my life to solve a problem with the college opportunity gap. I have scaled an effective organization that is serving. Right, across Northern California now, because the frustration is that the city inherently in, the, does not invest enough of its resources to make sure that all young people in all communities can thrive. Hi, I'm Robin Epley. I am a opinion columnist and I mostly cover the county beat. Um, so I was wondering uh, if you guys could talk a little bit about climate change. It's one of the most important issues of our time. Um, it has a variety of impacts in our area from smoke pollution to drought to flooding. Um, and I wanted to know uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you believe the city council's role is in addressing climate change and what policies specifically uh, you would pursue to help Sacramento eliminate carbon emissions. And let's start with, uh, I, I don't remember who went last, uh, first last time, so let's start with Karina. So climate change is something that our youth have been leading the way on. This is an area of concern because we're not as, at a sustainable place as a country and as the, the planet. We've got to take care of what we're going to leave behind for generations to come. So I support the city of Sacramento's climate change plan. And I think that we need to do more with green transportation, which means we need to pursue active transportation grants. We need to invest in electric buses. We need to make sure that we're promoting the use of zero emission vehicles. Also got to make sure that they're affordable because right now traffic makes up for greenhouse gas emissions to 56%, I believe is the statistic of how much it is. Um, and at the end of the day, we got to grow um, our, our reliance on, on bicycling and urban trails and making sure that we have connectors. And I think that we can do an incredible job together as both like the state, the county at the local level to, to work on these goals. And that means looking at plastics. It means building capacity and making sure that we're taking care of infrastructure. It means preparing for natural disasters like flooding, wildfires, heat waves. It means working with government agencies put in place today to help us combat a lot of these issues like SMUD, SACOG, ECOs, the Sunrise Movement, which I'm proud to be endorsed by the Sunrise Movement, because this is a coalition of young people ready to fight for change, specifically targeted on climate change and everything that we're pursuing at the city of Sacramento with electrification. I'm proud of this endorsement because these are the people doing the groundwork. And I am proud to have been the vice president of the Sacramento Democrats Environmental Club. And here we, we always publish different advocacy recommendations. We work with local and state level politicians to help see what we can do to promote sustainability, to help environmental causes. In Natomas, we have the name Natomas Basin Conservancy. We gotta make sure that people as we're planning and developing that we're still setting aside land 
for open spaces to protect natural habitat, our species, to give us more trees. I'm going to promote the tree canopy. There's a lot that we're doing as a city of Sacramento to help with sustainability and climate change. And I'm happy to support it all. And I'm proud to have the endorsements of people like former Mayor Heather Fargo and uh, Ray Trethewey, who represented this area, who have been fighting for climate change and for sustainability for over 30 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael? Yeah. Climate change is our biggest challenge, Robin. Right? It is our biggest challenge. Like climate change isn't just our biggest challenge because it's climate change and everybody will, will fill it over the course of this next couple of generations. Like climate change is a racial justice issue. Who, who has the greatest impact of an unjust climate? Like it is brown and black communities like in Sacramento. So the, the climate action plan does set us on the right path. But we need bolder action now to be able to actually have an effect on what we can affect within the city, which is largely around transportation, which is largely around residential and commercial or energy use. So if I just think about a story real quick and the climate injustice that I experienced, right? I grew up in communities that were surrounded by freeways where most of my friends had asthma. Uh, so like for me, it's a real life urgency to be able to act now because I know exactly like, what happened. So the climate action plan sets us on the, the right path. I think we have to build out much quicker a zero emission infrastructure where we are uh, building enough uh, for EV charging stations to, to prepare for the, the possibility, not the possibility, right, the incumbents of having a lot more electric vehicles. And we need to concentrate those EV stations, not just in Curtis Park or Lamb Park, but right in Northgate, like in Garden Land and South Antonis. We have to make sure that we expand public light rail, right on public transportation. Why can't we have no, it's been, it's been talking about probably since before I was born, um, a light rail station, a light rail that connects South Antonis to downtown and to the rest of the city. Like that's an important part of what we have to do. Infield development. Our neighborhoods are structured in a way where they're not walkable, they're not bikeable. The past couple of days, I've been walking down Northgate, uh, like, like, and through Gardenland, and you you have you have you have bike lanes that are about three feet wide. Uh, you have you don't have walkable little communities. So we have to think different how we're building neighborhoods, but in infill development. So infill development has to be a priority. It has to be a strategy. But we have to create communities where they have jobs housing and retail co-located co together so we don't have to drive you know 30 minutes down the road to be able to get to a job we can work where we live and we can eat where we live i think about the urban tree canopy i think about uh, again curtis park land park some of these beautiful communities where you have these huge trees that provide like that trap that cap that trap carbon uh, they also provide uh like a greater use of, of coolidge right during the summer because you have these big tree canopies, those same tree canopies have to be expanded right here in District 3, but not only District, all across the city of Sacramento. You go to Oak Park and you cross the, you cross the way to the community right next door, drastically different. So we have to implement those strategies and we have to act bold. We have to be quick and, and we have to make sure that we have the, uh, the, the collaborative leadership in place. I can take the next question. I'm Hannah Holzer, the opinion assistant at the B, and I'm going to switch gears to talk about homelessness. Um, so South Natomas has been heavily impacted by homelessness, especially along Garden Highway and in the district's parklands. Um, over the last year, the city council has invested public dollars and political capital in establishing safe grounds and sanctioned campsites where services can be offered. But the city has largely failed to deliver on those plans. So given the scale of this crisis and the deficit of shelter, would you welcome safe grounds in South Natomas or pursue a different policy? And uh, Michael, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, I think we have to. We have to. We have to do our part. We have, we have to do our part to make sure that we are leveraging the city resources necessary to bring them here. But homelessness for me, Hannah, like life personal. Uh, the reason why I got into the race was because in November, my mom became homeless. There's 112 different services, 63 different entry points within the city, right? I couldn't navigate them to be able to get my mom housing. Growing up, I was homeless both in eighth and ninth grade. Now it's gonna take collaborative leadership to be able to solve this issue, to bring people together. And, and that's what I've spent my career doing. You can imagine in building an organization, a nonprofit that has $9 million, employs 130 people, uh, serves 3,000 young people across five counties, 
that takes a great amount of work bringing people together, expressing a clear vision, and to be able to get forward. Uh, but I also think about, you know, it's, it's not just the temporary housing strategies that we that we need. We need a stronger coordinated service entry model. When you have, again, 112 different services, that was in the SACB, 63 different entry points, what you get is you get chaos. You get an ability to effectuate change because you don't have a good service entry model. We need to work with the county to be able to expand um, like more of the turnkey programs like, like this in the way of it, you know, what's in the new district three, state bridge suites, 116 unit uh, uh, a conversion where we, right, we bought a hotel to be able to convert it right, to family living. It's a phenomenal project. But we have to work with the county to be able to do more of that because it's a whole lot cheaper than the other strategy. We need to wait, make sure that we're investing and expanding mental health and substance abuse. COVID has only exacerbated every part of a mental health challenge that we have. Um, you, you know, I like the, the idea of the governor's the governor's care court, like in the ability to right to have a right to have a system that is dedicated to right folks. I think there is promise there to be able to do. Uh, but for me, I know when I think about the siting plan, what I think about is finger pointing. It's about like policymakers saying, "Hey, it's your problem. It's your problem. It's your problem." That's not my style of leadership, right? I've built an organization. I have solved problems in the organization you know, where I know what it's like to balance a budget. I know what it's like to have people depend on you. I know as a leader, the worst thing you can do is finger point. So for me, it's about making tangible change, bringing people together. And that's what I have done my entire career. Thank you, Karina. I work at City Hall now. And I have a hard time triaging families that come to us. Four years there, and now we have a community of response and Bridget Dean's amazing. She doesn't have the team that she needs, nor the programs that she needs to help us really, truly help people and meet people where they're at. People suffer from homelessness from a, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's rent. Sometimes it's domestic violence and leaving someone that has abused someone. Sometimes it's mental health. Sometimes it's substance abuse. Every single family, every single person has a unique story. So there will never be a one size fits all approach. I think I can think of a mother that had six kids. She was looking for shelter. There's a few programs that council members have put in place where there would be a one unit and people had to all use one communal restroom. That doesn't work. The rail yards, that doesn't work for that mom either. There's a lot of different unique situations. And I think that as we address homelessness, we need to understand that one size doesn't fit all approach. So in District 3, we have the State Bridge Hotel. That should hopefully be open this spring. That will house approximately 300 families. And there's gonna be 10 to 20 units for emergency shelter. We gotta make sure that we can take women or men that are suffering from domestic violence that call our police department for help. We gotta make sure we have somewhere to take these individuals to. Right now, there's also a proposal for Joshua's house. It's in front of Garden Valley Elementary. Do I support the idea? Yes. Do I think that's the best location for it? Maybe not. I think that there's better places. Roslyn Court. There's a lot of places there. So there's extended care. There's three different hotels that we can potentially buy. And there's a daycare for seniors and for people with disabilities called Right at Home down the street from them. How do we work together as county agencies to really streamline this process? Because I can tell you right now that I work at City Hall and it's tough. It's tough and I have to follow up on Sunday. I was following up to make sure that the family that reached out to us on Friday had received a voucher. That's what I was doing on Sunday night. And I, like my opponent, I'm sick of lip service. I am. I think we all are. And I think that we need to get to work and cut through the red tape because enough is enough. We're all feeling the problem. We're all frustrated with the issue and everyone in my district, as I'm knocking on doors, people are compassionate, but people want to see a small win. And that means housing are unhoused. Thank you, Karina. I think uh, Robin Epley has raised her hand. 
I do. I just have a quick follow up for each of you. So maybe just within a minute, minute and a half. Why, why um, you, let me say two minutes for the follow up. Sure. Um, I, you both touched on it just briefly, some of the finger pointing that's been going on between the city and the county. And I was wondering if uh, you could address that and how you see um, what, what the solution to that problem is, how specifically you would work to solve it. Um, let's start with uh, uh, Karina. I have good relationships with Supervisor Phil Cerna and Supervisor Patrick Kennedy who have both endorsed my candidacy. It is under my, it's my understanding that we at the county now have a new way of billing, of having the ability to bill Medi-Cal to be able to provide more beds and get more beds for our county. Uh, through the Sacramento County Office of Education, we're currently working with the county to get social workers at all of our schools, all of our schools in Sacramento County to hire 400 social workers. We currently hired 20 and we're working with the county health department and working with medical and our insurance companies to have that funding source and had to have a consistent funding source so for me it's 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 going to take leadership and i and i and i am ready and i am committed to helping solve this to helping solve this crisis i mean it's it's heavy it's complex but we got to do more and we got to do more conversation have more conversations we got to have conversations with the community. When we set up the State Bridge Hotel conversion, we had a town hall of 400 people that attended it. We told them what the project was, what the concept was, and we didn't have any pushback in the community because we did the legwork beforehand. There is a lot of nimbyism. There is. Not in my backyard. Let's help the unhoused, but not in my backyard. But you know what you do to combat that? You build trust. And you give people an advance notice of what your idea is, where you plan to take it, and secure a funding source. Securing a funding source, is specifically ongoing being the key word, is probably one of the most important things to making sure that a program can get started, go vertical, start servicing people, and truly have results. We got to make sure we secure that funding. That is so important. And enough with the lip service. We got to get to work. Thank you, Karina. Michael? Yeah, Robin, I can just say that uh, that bold bold decision making and bold collaborative leadership means that you're going to have a whole bunch of people who disagree with you. So in Sacramento County, it's the capital of black, of black student suspensions in Sacramento County. So what we did was we created a campaign called the 1300 campaign, 1300campaign.org. That brings uh, a philanthropic business, K through 12 superintendents, college presidents together. And we said, hey, listen, we have this problem of suspension, we have this problem with underachievement among young men of color. Let's work with school districts to be able to solve it. So we brought everybody together, all different parties together, the leaders together, and we expressed a clear goal and outcome what we want to be able to do. The 1300 campaign in October of last year got Natomas Unified to ban suspensions for willful defiance only. First school district in the region to be able to do it. But that wasn't done by Michael Lynch. That, that, that was done by an idea bringing people together despite all the other people who thought it wasn't a good idea right we got consensus on the vision of what we want to be able to do right so we are stubborn with the vision flexible with the path it's the same thing about collaborative leadership like in order to bring like we we have to express like in sacramento county a clear vision of, of where we want to be able to go what's the number of homeless people we want to be able to get sheltered let's bring the community along Right, and let's put the resources and the time that's needed. But the, the red tape and the finger pointing, that's not how you get stuff done. You express a vision, you bring the right people together for it, and you move forward to action. And you hold people accountable. It's not done. Thank you both. Continuing on this topic a bit, um, you both may know that the mayor's uh, proposed uh, an ordinance creating a legally enforceable right to housing. Um, and there may be a similar uh, uh, proposal on the ballot this fall. Um, this would mean that the city would be legally obligated to provide uh, housing or shelter for all its residents and uh, that, that people could, could sue if, if shelter isn't available. Um, it would also come with a uh, an enforceable 
uh, obligation to accept shelter for individuals uh, who are offered it. Uh, we're wondering whether each of you supports a policy like this, why or why not? And if you don't, um, what, what do you think would be a more effective approach to actually making a dent in, uh, in homelessness? Uh, and I think we'll start with Michael. Yeah, this is a, I mean, told you all earlier, right, Josh, one of the reasons why I decided to run for city council, because I feel like they weren't making enough progress on homelessness. You know, when my mom experienced homelessness, and I realized when I was trying to get services and housing for her, uh, took five months. I mean, it's like she'll move into a place right for the first time next week. Uh, so like that's to me is an issue that is that is critical. Uh, like on the, for, like for us to be able to move, move forward. It, look, like in this, like Mayor Steinberg has done an exceptional amount. He has brought in more resources than any other mayor like in Sacramento history to be able to move homelessness forward. But the city council has not moved swiftly or quickly enough to be able to do it. But unfortunately, I can't support as written the mayor's right to housing proposal. Uh, there are too many unintended consequences, you know, like the ability, right, the right to action for homeless people to sue the city government that could cripple and hurt our ability to deliver effective services. On the other hand, I see some promise and possibility with the homeless ballot initiative. Like it really going to require city government to, to do a whole lot more than what it's doing right now. So I see that as a potential path forward in, in a way that requires the city to move a whole lot forward because what we what we see right now is just a lack of inaction. The siting plan, which is this great plan, is just sitting there. Right? You have what well, you have two sites. Right, that have right, been able to be moved. You have a lack of action on a really good, right, a really great plan. Like the homeless ballot initiative will provide sort of the framework to require city leaders to do it. So I see that as a possibility. I understand that the language is still being negotiated and there's a lot of other stuff to be able to, to have. But I see the, yeah, the homeless ballot initiative as, a, as possibly a better avenue to get city leaders to move quickly on this issue but rather than the finger pointing and political infighting that's taking place right now at City Hall. Karina? You mentioned earlier in one of my comments that um, that homelessness, uh, District 3 is feeling the impacts of homelessness quite a bit. It's the number one thing that people want to talk about, talk about when I'm knocking on doors. And People are very compassionate. People very much understand all the underlying issues of people experiencing homelessness. And I think that our community is ready to support plans or programs that will put in District 3 when the time comes so long that there's a real plan of implementation. You know, to me, a vision is just a vision unless it has a framework and implementation of success and a funding line. So. In regards to this, these ballot measures, I know that the county is working on one. Uh, Supervisor Patrick Kennedy is working on one. Um, the city is working, the mayor is working on one. And then the proponents are currently securing uh, the ballot signatures needed to, to put it on the ballot. And I've heard uh, that the proponents and the city of Sacramento are working on bringing the two proposals together, but I haven't seen it yet. So I do look forward to seeing it. And then after that, being able to take a stance on it, whether I'll support it or oppose it. But at the end of the day, we must do more for housing for our unhoused. And that means getting creative. If that's safe spaces for people to camp, that means safe parking lots for people to place their RVs. If that means converting hotels, if that means more Section 8 vouchers, if that's converting, um, we just got to get creative. We got to look at every single opportunity that comes across our lap to make sure that we can get a program up and going. Enough is enough. We feel the impacts and we really just got to get to work. So my personal belief, all I, what number one thing I care about is making sure that we have wraparound services that go with the housing that we are able to provide families. Wraparound services will be the key to success, to helping our unhoused become sheltered, get a job, and be able to move on in life. 
that's going to be the number one thing that I look for as I review these ballot measures is those wraparound services. But I'm open to suggestions in terms of safe places to camp in District 3. I'm open to securing sites, and I will work with every single community leader in District 3 to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we vet the site, and that we have a community advisory commission to help oversee the project. I think that will create accountability. And I'm excited because I think I can do more for our community. I, I want to ask you guys a little bit about leadership. Uh, you know, your candidacies are part of an ongoing generational shift in, in the city council, uh, you know, with millennials and, and progressive voices assuming larger, larger leadership roles. Um, for better or worse, you know, many voters are, are skeptical of young candidates and, and liberal politicians. And, uh, you know, I'd be curious to hear sort of what your message is to voters uh, who may be reluctant to back candidates like yourselves. And uh, Karina, let's start with you. I think my involvement, so one, I, I am 33. I am a small business owner. Trustee is my ballot designation. Small business owner is my ballot designation. Me and my brother have a food truck. I have been serving this community that I hope to represent for the last four years as trustee on the Sac County Board of Education. I ran a vaccination clinic at Natomas High School where I helped vaccinate over 30,000 people in this community. I canvassed these neighborhoods saying, hey, come out here every Tuesday. We set up, a, we, we did equity in action. We set up a hotline that had 15 different people speaking different, different languages every Monday, the Tuesday before, or, or every Monday, the Tuesday before the links were open to the general public to make sure that people with technology barriers, language barriers, also had access to vaccinations. I passed a $172 million school bond helping this community with school infrastructure. I, I'm involved with the different community organizations. As our food truck, we go to Stanford Settlement, we go to Greenhouse, we go to the different events that the community hosts, and we're at the schools, sometimes doing school fundraisers where 15% of the profits go to the school. People know me, people have seen my face. They saw me in 2018 when I knocked on their door. They saw me distributing hotspots. They saw me accessing computers. They saw me helping with digital broadband access and working with the different digital providers in the different apartment complexes to make sure kids were connected to their devices. Because of my leadership during the pandemic, my colleagues allowed me to be president of the Board of Education this year during election year. That says a lot because I was on the ground helping our community being consistent with my messaging, telling them I didn't know the answers to their questions when I didn't know. Because the worst thing that we can do as politicians, you wanna call us that, is say that we have the answers to all the problems in our city. We don't, but we're leaders. And we gotta accept the facts that we don't know, accept when we're wrong, accept when we, when we fail, and move on and try again and build trust and admit when we're wrong. And I'm not scared to ask for help. And I'm thankful for the endorsements and the support that I have because I have hotlines of institutional knowledge like our former mayor, Heather Fargo, who I get a call to say, can you please tell me the history of this neighborhood? How did we get to where we're at? You know, thanks to her leadership, Natomas is one of the most diverse zip codes in our country, we have over 15 languages that are spoken. Inclusionary housing in Natomas is what it makes it today. Like thanks to the leadership of her of her time, we have inclusionary housing in, in, in South Natomas. That's why the houses look the way that they are. And we were so creative with housing back then. So thank you, yeah, I'm thankful. Yeah, same same question to Michael. I mean, what would your message be to voters who are reluctant about uh, you know younger Candidates like yourself. Yeah, you said, man, I can't tell you how many times, brother, I knocked on the door, man, right? And be like, how old are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, right, but like, very similar to Karina. Like, I'm 33 years old, right? I own a home in the district, right? Where I'm raising a family, right, in the district. Our IYT headquarters is off of Northgate. My daughter goes to school about 50 feet from where I'm at, off of Northgate. My son goes to daycare at Peace Lutheran on San Juan Northgate. I talk about my connection to the district. I talk about how since 2016, we have probably served 
right, over a thousand families right in like Natomas, right, right, right in South Natomas, Garland and Northgate, right through our programs at Natomas High School, Discovery High School, Jefferson K-8, Real Tier. But my, my favorite one, Yusef, is when I knock on the door and I say, hey, I'm Michael Lynch. But then we start talking, they're like, oh, you're the CEO of IYT. My son went through IYT. I knocked on the door in South Natomas and the mom, the one answered the door, she's like, so Mike, I know who you are, right? My son is like Clark Atlanta because of you. So to me, like that, like that's a story where it's like, okay, right? The message to the voters is, hey, listen, I am qualified. I'm a community-based uh, uh, CEO who works with young people and families. And I've been doing this work for nine years and I've built a successful organization that employs 130 people, right? My message to voters is, hey, listen, I'm raising a family here, right? My, my, my roots are connected here. Um, and I'm qualified to be able like, to serve. And you know, since we serve, you know, 2,000 or so young people in Sacramento County, and we serve, you know, we have several programs right here. All I gotta do is talk about the work. Oftentimes I mention some names and we're communicating, Yusef, we can kind of get it. But the message is always, hey, listen, I am not a politician. I am not a part of the this like the status quo. I think the status quo has not worked. That's why I decided to run. I am a new vision with a new leadership who has been, who is not new to the district, who has been connected to this community before the campaign and will, con and will be connected to this community because my wife won't allow me to move uh, right after like this campaign. All right, uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? If not, I can throw one in, but if someone has a question, I, I will yield. All right, uh, so uh, this will be the last question since we're, we're almost at time. So uh, um, we have a new police chief, uh, obviously being tested right now. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the community about the police department in Sacramento having very strained relations with the black community in particular. Um, there are some questions in terms of whether uh, uh, the, um, the, the 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 police department is in a position to be able to uh, get witnesses to come forward and speak in this in this horrible tragedy because of those strained relations. So, if you're on the city council, um, uh, uh, would you would you be in favor of increasing the size of the police department, uh, or would you divert uh, resources away from the police department uh, to more community based uh, organizations? And let's start with Karina. I know we've had over 200 submissions of video footage and uh, photos submissions from the community in regards to the incident. And I think that we as Sacramento, um, as a community, did a good job just kind of relaying the same message saying, please help us uh, give the families impacted by this incident some peace to know exactly what happened. Um, when something horrible happens, you just want to know like what happened. It just kind of gives you gives one security to know how your loved one uh, passed away. And if you don't have it, it's really tough. So I'm thankful for all the community leaders that have helped our police department be able to find two people um, in relationship to the shooting that happened yesterday. Uh, in regards to the police budget, I think it depends on what the line item is. If there's positions where police officers are currently getting paid the pay that they get paid that civilians can do, I'm open to switching that. And that means decreasing the budget. That means touching their pension. No, because a promise is a promise and a promise made is a promise kept. If that means looking at alternatives to how much it costs to, to store the body cam footage. Yes, because right now we're paying a lot of money in our budget to help store the videos that our police officers have to wear day in and day out and the police officers behind the desk that have to view those videos. I think it's important to pass legislation and to increase accountability and transparency and to move positions where you're responding to a call, making sure it can be a community resource officer, not exactly a police officer that responds to a call the next day after an incident happens if it's not a 911. We need our police officers to be present when it's a 911 call, when someone calls in for domestic violence and needs help we need our police officers to be able to respond and have the, the, the equipment and the support that they need to be successful to help the victim. 
the person calling and asking for help. But do I think that there's ways where we can somehow find reductions? Yes, and I'm happy to work with the city manager. I'm happy to work with SPOA's leadership to make sure that we can make those changes because the community is asking for it. But the community is also asking for more public safety. In District 3, when I'm knocking on doors, they're asking for public safety. But like I said, it is supporting our fire department. It is supporting our police department, but it's also prevention. And it's working with community members and people that respond to the scenes, like on Sunday night, that know firsthand what it's like for those families going through the trauma that they're going through to provide that level of comfort and support of saying, you know what, I've been there, it hurts, I'm here for you. What can I do? And I think that we need to do a better job of making sure that we can respond to national crises together. Thank you, Karina. Michael, three minutes. Yeah, I'm a Marcos. I'm a black male, uh, uh, right? Whose whose family has been severely impacted by the war on drugs, by the school to prison pipeline, by the criminal justice system, and every aspect of it. The most recent police uh, survey. Like Sac PD survey, so that like seventy five percent of Black people, when when it comes to whether or not you view somebody the same, are you know like when if you're Black, you feel that you do not get an equal treatment under the law. You feel that you are like if you are an other. My my first interaction, Marco, with with police was when I was seven years old. We were put in back of a police car. Um, my brother my brother was arrested. Right, we were put in back of a police car because we threw a rock and it hit the tire of the car. So a police officer came and arrested my brother, put me in the back at seven years old. So we know that there is a mistrust among police and a part of a safe community is building that trust. So when it comes to like public safety, I am for like investing in officers if that is the strategy that's needed. I think we need to make sure that we invest in SAC PD. We have the, we have, we retain high quality officers that represent the community. I think we have to think differently about policing. The, the policing model as it is does not work because a part of a safe community is relationships between officers and, and citizens. And if a group of citizens does not feel uh, safe around an officer, then we have a tragic issue. So community-based policing has to be a part of our model. We talked about earlier about it. What would it look like? Like if we were, when we were, instead of driving down the street, we we're able to get out and walk and build relationships, have conversations. When I was a kid, um, I played in the police athletic league, football league, and that was that was another positive interaction I had with young people. But we need to put young people and right police together to be able to build positive relationships. But I agree with Karina. We we also need to expand the Department of Community Response for non-emergency 911 calls. Like right, so instead of maybe a cop coming out there and putting me in the back of a police car when I was seven years old, maybe a social worker, or a counselor, or somebody who, who could have came out and said, "Hey, I heard you threw a rock somewhere." Like, why did you do that? You know, so right, to be able to expand the community response, um, I think about like trusted programs, like the Peacemake Fellowship, like Brother to Brother and how they play with interaction. Because what happens in Sacramento in every community is like, if somebody shoots at me, right, I'm a, but let's say I'm 19 and, right, I, right, and someone shoots at me and I'm involved in that lifestyle, I'm probably gonna shoot back at them. So there has to be an interaction between that point. And that's what advanced peace, Peacemakers Fellowship, and that's what Brother to Brother does. But we have to think differently about police and police accountability. That's why I chose not to take police money. It was like for me, like a standpoint to be able to know that this is an issue of safety within our community. And at times it can be hard to hold people accountable to, to receiving a check from them. Can I add a statement real quick? Uh, real quick. Um, I know my opponent just mentioned police money. For the record, I do want to say that I have accepted police contributions. At the same time, my opponent also interviewed for the endorsement, tried really hard to get it, and was not successful. So I want the record to state that. Marcus, hold on, Marcus. I got sure, 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 sure. Marcus, they called me 24 hours before the interview. So out of respect, right, I showed up. Out of respect, 24 hours. So you can imagine how much uh, thought they have for me on, or for me to be able to support their priorities. To call someone 24 hours before an interview, kind of tell someone, you know, you, you really don't care. Because what I, what I want to do is transform community and transform policing. That's why they don't want me on City Hall. 